All right, let's turn in our Bibles now to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, and the title of my message is King for a Day. We're gonna talk about what happened on that first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. But let me begin with a question. What makes you mad? Don't say preachers that go too long. <laughs> but really, everybody has something that irritates. And now, we display our anger in different ways. Some people just explode with anger, scream a little bit, and then they feel better afterwards. They calm down quickly. Everybody else is devastated, but they feel better. Other people are more like a slow boil, and once they get up there, it's hard to cool them down again, but we all have our boiling point. We all have that one thing that maybe sets us off a little bit, or things that at least irritate us. I'll just identify a few things that bug me. I won't say they make me mad necessarily, but they bug me. A lot of them have to do with cell phones, okay? Uh, I was so excited when cell phones first came out. I thought, what a great invention. Now I've come to kind of hate them, really. Everybody has them, of course. You know, every person, they give them to small babies now, dogs and cats. Everyone has a cell phone. So they're pretty much everywhere you look. And here's what bugs me. A person who has a cell phone turned up to the loudest ring and lets it ring five times before they answer it. Why? And then when they answer it, they're too loud. Hello! Yeah! Why are you yelling into the cell phone? And what is the deal with those things you put in your ears now? Now, I know they're little Bluetooth devices so you can uh, be on the phone and be hands-free. And, and I'm for that. And by the way, that's a law in California, which would come as a shock to a lot of people <laughs> because I still see a lot of people talking on their cell phones. I will not talk on a cell phone when I'm driving my car, but... Everyone else seems to disregard this law. And, you know, so we have these little devices you put on the ear, and I suppose that's efficient when you're driving, but then they wear them afterwards. They, they wear them to church, you know, in the service, a little blue lights going off, or they wear them in the shower to bed. I don't know. <laughs> Is that supposed to impress us? I don't know. It's not a fashion accessory, okay? I actually saw a guy the other day with one in each ear, and I wondered, what is going on here? <laughs> because first of all, sometimes I think people are talking to me when they're talking to someone else. Uh, they'll have one, they go, hey, how you doing? I'll say, I'm fine, then they'll walk right behind me. What was <laughs> Oh, you have one of those, oh, I see. And if you had one in each ear, how do you talk to two people like, hey, how you doing? Shut up, no, I love you, I hate you, what? I don't know, depending on the conversation, could get very schizophrenic, but anyway, cell phones just drive me crazy. Okay, now, here's another one. Why is it that when I go to a takeout restaurant, I'm always behind the person buying food for the entire baseball team? <laughs> so talk, and no one's behind me, it's just me and this person and they give them bag after bag. The, the, the van is lowering, you know, with all the food. Why does that always happen to me? Now, ATM machines, uh, just a suggestion. Get your card out when you're in line. You are going to use it in the ATM machine. I've actually gotten it down to a point where I try to figure how quickly I can do it. I, I've gotten it under a minute. I just walk in, card in, code, fum, 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 fum. Boom, I'm out, I'm done. Other people... It's like they wait in line, and then when they get their turn, they have, they have to find their card. Where was the card? Couldn't you have done this while you were waiting for the last 20 minutes? And I'm not gonna say if it's guys or girls that do this, but <laughs> girls um, <laughs> going to the purse and the, oh, here it is, and I don't know. Why is it when I travel I always get seated behind the one guy that feels he must recline for the entire flight. You know, when you're in coach, you really shouldn't recline. I'll take it back one click. You're already like this, you know. One click, click, that's it. You know, but I'm always on the guy all the way back. I look at his greasy scalp for the whole. <laughs> then I read recently that they're looking to allow people to use cell phones in airplanes. Oh, that's perfect. So now I can have the guy with the greasy scalp with a Bluetooth device in each ear talking too loudly and driving us all crazy. Do I sound bitter? 
Bitter, party of one. Well, yeah, we have things that irritate us, that bother us, and it's not good to be angry. Uh, actually, a Harvard study done in 2006 revealed that 10 million adult men in the United States are so angry they're sick. In fact, their disease is a name. It's IED, Intermittent Explosive Disorder. Uh, another study was done that revealed that bad-tempered people are three times more likely to have heart attacks. We've all done something or said something in a fit of anger we have come to regret later because anger makes you say and do things you wish you had not done. Uh, one expert said, quote, the angry we, angrier we get, the more stupid we become. When our emotional brain is in charge, we see things in black and white and we're likely to make stupid and damaging decisions. Isn't that true? Have you ever said something, you, know, you felt so right saying it, and then the adrenaline wears off and you think to yourself, what was I thinking? Or, or worse yet, that email you sent off in anger. So, you know, you were, you were like, <laughs> typing it. Can I make a suggestion? If that's how you type the email, do not hit send. Sit on it for at least a night. You might actually just throw it in the trash and just feel better once you vent it a little bit. But once that thing is in cyberspace, there's no retrieving it. I know, you send it, then you think, what have I just done? You go over to Google, how do I retrieve an email? <laughs> Answer, you don't, comma, idiot. <laughs> Having said all that, there are times when it's good to be angry. You say, well, how's that possible? Isn't all anger bad? Not necessarily. There's something called righteous indignation. And before us here in Luke chapter 19, we're going to look at a time when Jesus Christ, God incarnate, was angry. Real angry. So angry, in fact, that he was overturning tables as he drove people away. We're also going to see where Jesus wept. So in this chapter, we are given a rare glimpse into the humanity of Jesus, who was fully God, yet at the same time fully man. He displayed anger, righteous indignation, as well as deep sorrow, reminding us that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 5.15 says, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tested as we are, yet without sin. Today is Palm Sunday, and this text that we're about to read is the account of what happened on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago and immediately following. There was a sense uh, as we come into this story that something big was about to happen. Something significant was about to take place. There was an air of expectancy and excitement. Why? Verse 11 tells us, because they believed that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now understand this. The general perception at the time was when Messiah came, he would establish his kingdom on earth, which was not wrong, but they were just missing a huge component of the role and purpose of the Messiah. Indeed, Scripture teaches Messiah will come and establish his kingdom on earth. That is still in our future. But Scripture also teaches that first Messiah would come and suffer and die for the sins of the world. We find it in places like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. But yet that was largely lost on the people of this day. So they thought Jesus was the Messiah coming to overthrow the tyranny of Rome and establish his kingdom. Thus they cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. It was a glorious day. And then it seems as though things went awry. But they didn't go awry at all. He was doing exactly what he had come to do. Yes, he was their king, but only for a day. That, by the way, is the title of this message, King for a Day, because he did not meet their expectations. But Jesus was doing exactly what he had come to do. Know this, the incarnation, that is the birth of Jesus, was for the purpose of the atonement, that is, the death of Jesus. The birth of Jesus was so there would be the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus was so there would be the resurrection of Jesus. And the death and resurrection of Jesus happened so we could live eternally and have our sins forgiven. 
So the cross was his goal and destination from the very beginning. That is why Revelation 13.8 describes Christ as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means before there was a planet called Earth or a garden called Eden or a man named Adam or a woman named Eve, a decision was made in the councils of eternity that God would become a man and go to a cross and die and rise again from the dead. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it was clear that from the moment of his birth Jesus lived in the shadow of the cross. It was clear that Christ was destined to die and not only to die but to die under the wrath of God. Let's read now the account found here in Luke 19 that describes Palm Sunday. Luke 19 verse 37. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you, and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone left upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's pray together for a moment. Lord, as we come now to this great story of Palm Sunday, help us to see what it means to us today. Help us to grasp what took place when you wept and also displayed anger. Lord, speak to us from your word we would ask now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this action of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey was a real attention getter. You have to understand something that Christ was now saying the moment has arrived. You know Jesus would often touch and heal people and he would say things like don't tell anyone. Keep this to yourself. Why? He said He would often say, for my hour has not yet come. What was he talking about? He was talking about the hour of his death and resurrection. My hour has not yet come. Well, you know what? His hour has now come. So he deliberately comes into the city in a very public way, a way designed to attract attention and also in a way to fulfill Bible prophecy. Of course, he comes riding on the donkey. This doesn't make sense to us because we would think that a a conquering king, the Messiah, should come in on a white Arabian stallion or something like that. A donkey? You know, that'd be like having a big ticker tape parade and the the guest of honor comes in a little Prius, you know, just driving. (laughs) Sorry if you're a Prius owner. (laughs) Really sorry if you're a Prius owner. (laughs) But uh, I know you get good mileage. Doesn't stop so well, but still. But here's the thing. He rides a donkey because in this culture it meant a lot. You need to understand that in these days when a Roman general would would return from war victorious, he would come into the city riding on a donkey. That was a way of saying, I'm a hero. We pulled it off. Welcome me. So the Romans understood what he was saying. He was saying, I'm a conquering hero. And the Jews understood he was saying, I am the Messiah. Why would they think that? Because Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, even a colt, the fowl of the ass. See, he was fulfilling prophecy. For Malachi 3.1 says, Look, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and you will see me suddenly come into the temple. The messenger of the covenant, covenant who you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord God Almighty. 
He was forcing the authorities' hand. How so? Well, you have to understand, at this moment, Jesus was a wanted man. He had a price on his head. I don't know if there were like little, you know, flyers around town with a picture of Jesus, wanted, dead or alive, Jesus, the Nazarene. But he was wanted. And he knew he was wanted. But just to show you that he was in control of everything that was happening, he comes marching into town, not as a helpless victim, unaware of what lies ahead, but as a powerful victor marching bravely into battle. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, the people say in verse 38. Another gospel tells us they cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. So on the surface, surface it was a very happy day. The disciples' hearts must have been leaping for joy as the masses were seen what they knew all along that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. This is it. You know, they had known he was the Messiah, but now everyone's getting it, and they're happy. There's like a, a big party going on. You can almost see the people all, celebrate good times, come on, Danny. Oh, by the way, I hate that song. <laughs> How many of you hate that song? Raise your hand. How many of you like the song? Raise your hand. Really? You like it? Come up here, I want to pray for you. <laughs> Sir, do you drive a Prius? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, let me just make it worse. Do you have a cat? Oh, I'm gonna get the letters. People, can I just tell you something? I'm joking. People get so upset. Why do you denigrate cats? Answer, because it bothers you. And you take it too seriously. Relax. But dogs are better than cats. But anyway, coming back to this. We all know it's true. <laughs> yeah, they're having a party. Everybody's having a great time. But they're misunderstanding. You see, they wanted Jesus as their king as long as it was on their terms. They wanted a deliverer and a Messiah that would conform to their plans instead of they to his. They wanted Jesus to destroy Rome, not their cherished sins or their hypocritical, superficial religion. There's a lot of people like this today. Oh yeah, they'll sing the praises of a Jesus that will give them wealth and success and personal happiness, but they recoil from the idea of a God that would ask for obedience, commitment, and sacrifice. Like the multitude at the triumphal entry, they'll loudly acclaim Jesus as long as they believe he will satisfy their selfish desires. But yet this same multitude turned on him only days later. The same people crying Hosanna on Sunday were saying crucify him on Friday. What happened? What happened was they didn't understand who God was. They just understood what they wanted him to be. You know, we like God as long as God fits into our plans. But the moment he does something we don't like, we'll say, well, I don't like this at all. In fact, I'm mad at God. I've heard people say that. I'm mad at God. Really? You're mad at God? Yes, I am. And I think I probably should forgive him, but I'm mad. You have no right to be mad at God. Who do you think you are? Here's what God says in Romans 9.33. Who in the world do you think you are to second guess God? Do you for one moment suppose that any of us knows enough to call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the fingers that molded saying, why did you shape me like this? Listen, he is the potter, you are the clay. He is the shepherd, you are the sheep. He is the vine, you are the branches. He is the giver, you are the recipient. He is God and you are a punk. <laughs> you are. And I am too. It's ridiculous for us to say, I'm mad at God. Now, if you were to say to me, well, I'm, I'm hurt, and I don't understand why something happened. I can understand that. If you say to me, I don't understand God, I can see that. If you, could even, if you would even say to me, I've asked God why, I understand that. I just talked to a lady in our bookstore last service and her young boy was killed in an accident. And she said, I've said why many times. I said, I understand. 
after our son went to be with the Lord in 2008, in a message I gave that was later aired on radio, I said, there's nothing wrong with asking God why. A man wrote me and said, you don't know how much those words help me because you see, my son was murdered. And he says, and I could not understand it. And you know, Christians come with trite little sayings when something like this happens. And a lot of times they don't help at all. They actually kind of hurt. They'll say, well, you know, God had a purpose in it and all things work together for good to those that look God. Well, Greg, what are you saying? It's wrong to quote the scripture? No, it's right to quote it. But there's a time and place for everything. And sometimes people will come with a little smile on their face and a quick verse to quote. And you know what? It's just not the time. When someone's son is murdered, and this man said to me, when you said uh, it's okay to ask God why, it was so helpful to me. And since then he's forgiven the person who murdered his son, who came to faith, by the way, shortly before he died. And this man now is trusting the Lord, knowing he'll see his son again. But here's my point. Even Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's okay to not understand. It's okay to question. But don't tell me you're mad at God. Or others will say, well, I've lost my faith. You know, this bad thing happened. I've just lost my faith. Can I respectfully say, then you never had real faith to begin with. A faith that can be lost is no faith at all. As Randy Alcorn has said, and I quote, a faith that can't be shaken is the faith that has been shaken. Again, a faith that can't be shaken is the faith that has been shaken. You see, you're going to be tested in your faith as life passes by. And if your faith is genuine, it will not go away or dissipate, and you will not lose it. It will actually grow stronger through times of difficulty. Yeah, but we get upset with God because we don't like what he does. But here's something that we may not like. A quote from Chuck Swindoll. I guess I'll blame it on him. But it's a good quote. He says, God is able to do what he pleases with whomever he chooses whenever he wishes. God is able to do what he pleases with whomever he pleases whenever he wishes. This is called the sovereignty of God. We don't always like it because it's not what we want, but God can do what he, want, what he wants when he wants to do it. So these people were misunderstanding the role and mission of Jesus. So he comes in, they're celebrating, they're laughing, they're cheering, they're having a great time. And what is Jesus doing? Look at verse 41. He saw the city and he wept over it. Here is the crowd whipped into a frenzy and Jesus is weeping. The crowd is rejoicing and Christ is sobbing. By the way, this is the second time Jesus wept openly, at least that we know of in Scripture. I'm sure there were others, but the other time was at the tomb of Lazarus. We have the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. You remember? He came to that tomb. The people were gathered as good friends, Mary and Martha. Lazarus was his friend as well. He spent a lot of time in their home. And he joined the crowd in weeping just as he weeps with us in sympathy when we have lost a loved one. He shares in that sorrow. But maybe another reason that Jesus wept was for poor Lazarus. You say, why would he weep for Lazarus? Because he was in heaven. No, no, that, wasn't the, that was the great thing. The sad thing was Lazarus was going to have to leave heaven and come back to earth. Oh no, poor Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Can you imagine being Lazarus? You're in glory. You're in heaven. It's great. And the father says, buddy, I have some good news and some bad news. <laughs> What's the good news? You'll be back. What's the bad news? Jesus is calling and you got to go. And back he is on earth. And not on earth any time special. I mean, not on earth in a time maybe that would be more desirable. He's in, on the earth in the first century. Those were tough times to be alive. But there he saw the face of Jesus. I'm sure that more than compensated for it. He wept. Why did Jesus weep? He wept because his ministry was almost over. Time was short. And by and large, he had been rejected. He had healed their sick. He had raised their dead. He had cleansed their lepers. He had fed their hungry. He forgave their sins. And yet he remained mostly alone and rejected. Scripture says he came unto his own and his own received him not. 
Not only that, but being God and having omniscience, all knowledge, he knew that one of his own hand-picked disciples, Judas, would betray him. He knew another would deny him, Simon Peter. He knew that Caiaphas, the high priest, would conspire with Pilate, the Roman gover governor, to bring about his death. He knew these fickle people saying Hosanna would soon be saying crucify him. But most of all he knew their future. The future of Jerusalem. And it wasn't pretty. Looking ahead he saw the destruction that would come upon Jerusalem in 40 years. Because we know looking back now historically in 70 AD the Roman legions came in led by Titus. And after a siege of 143 days killed 600,000 Jews and took thousands captive. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that during that time rivers of blood flowed through the gates of this city as the beloved temple was burned to the ground and because of the gold that was in the temple melted into the crevices of the rocks as a result of the fire it was taken bound down stone by stone fulfilling to a T the prediction of Jesus. He wept. He wept because he was being rejected. This breaks his heart and it still does. Unbelief and rejection breaks God's heart. Why? Because he knows the consequences. Yes, the Lord placed the planets in orbit. He made the light shine out of the darkness. But when the door of the human heart is shut, he refuses to enter forcibly. He will only knock, wanting to gain admittance, but when he is denied, knowing the repercussions that will follow, his heart is broken. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. He does not say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and I'll huff and puff and blow the door down, like the big bad wolf. Nor does he say, I stand at the door and knock, and if you don't open it, I'll kick it in because I want to. No, he waits for us to welcome him in, to open our hearts, to receive him. And when we don't, it breaks his heart because, listen, God will not violate human will. Even if that choice is wrong, he won't violate it. He's given us the ability to choose. But when, he, when we choose the wrong thing, it breaks his heart because he knows the repercussions that will come in this life as we sin and disobey God and reap the consequences and in the life to come as we are eternally separated from him. It hurts when someone rejects what you believe. When you tell them all about what Jesus has done for you and they laugh in your face or they insult you or they curse you or they turn and walk away. That hurts, doesn't it? And it hurts the Lord. That is why he wept. But after this weeping he was going to fulfill his purpose. Now, we know that after this Jesus entered into the temple. He looked around. He assessed the situation. And then returned to Bethany to spend the night with friends. The following morning he returns and takes action. We have seen what makes God weep. Now let's see what makes God angry. Go back to Luke 19 verse 45. And he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it saying, It is written, My house is a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. And the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to him. Now, what was this all about? Was this an explosion of anger? Was Jesus having a temper tantrum? Hardly. It was righteous indignation. He goes into the temple. He assesses the situation. And then he comes back to take action. Whenever God displays anger, it's for a reason. The Gospel of Mark gives us a few more details about this. In Mark eleven fifteen, we read, When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the merchants and their customers. Listen. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the stalls of those selling doves. I love this. What happened to that benign hippie Jesus? You know the one we see in religious art, that scrawny little dude that couldn't lift a branch off the ground. Well you know what, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's the Jesus of weird religion. The Jesus of the New Testament was strong. Well, how do you know that, Greg? Well he was a carpenter by trade. He built things. 
He built chairs and tables and houses and carts. He worked hard. Also we know that when he stood before Pontius Pilate and Pilate decided to scourge him and he took it, afterwards Pilate pointed to the scourge, beaten, bloody Jesus who still stood in his own power and he said, Eke homo, which means behold the man. Jesus was the man. He was a man's man, really. He carried a 400 pound cross on his shoulder after being scourged to the streets of Jerusalem. Let's see you bodybuilders pull that off. Yeah, he was a man. So he overturned tables. And these were big tables. And by the way, you want to make a point, overturn a table. You know, if you're in a restaurant, you don't like your food, <laughs> I mean, you know what will happen? You'll get thrown out. You'll probably get arrested. You'll certainly make a point. I didn't like this omelet. Yeah. But you see, you've seen it in so many Westerns. I don't, it's like, it makes me laugh whenever I watch a Western because there's certain things that are the same in all Westerns. For instance, in the saloon, okay? You go through those doors and here's what you always see. There's the bar and, and there's the barkeep, you know, usually kind of, kind of cleaning the bar and a couple of cowboys sitting there, you know. And, and then there's always the piano player. Now he always wears a little derby hat, right? It's just, it's a law of Westerns. A little, and he has little garter belts here, boom, boom, you know, uh, pulling the sleeve. Bing, 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 bing. Little upright piano, has to be an upright piano. And it's always that stupid song he's playing. Okay, now, over to the table where the guys are gambling. One of the cowboys looks at the other and says, you're cheating. I ain't cheating. Yes, you are. He turns the table over. The cards and chips go flying. The piano player always stops. Bing, 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 bing. He dives under a table. Fist fights break out. Guns start firing. You've seen the scene. It's a violent act to overturn a table, and Jesus knew it. He was provoking them. But how does this square with the statement of Christ in Matthew eleven twenty-nine 29, when he says, I am meek and humble in heart. I think that's why in religious art, Jesus always looks so meek. You know, really, he looks weak, doesn't he? Weak. I won't hurt you. That's not Jesus. He's meek. See, it's because people don't know what meekness is. Meekness is not weakness. Like, let's say you're a scrawny little dude and some big muscular guy kicks sand in your face on the beach. You know, like those little things in the back of comic books when I was a kid? Always something to tell you how you can get in shape. And, uh, and the little guy doesn't fight back. Why? Because he can't. Okay? So let's say some bully picks on you and you don't strike back. Is that because you're meek? No. It's because you're afraid. And you're weak and you don't have the ability to stop him. But let's say you're trained in mixed martial arts and the guy harasses you and you don't strike back. Is that because you're meek? No. Weak? No. That's because you're meek. Because meekness means power under constraint. It's the idea of a horse, a mighty stallion, and you have that bit in, and you pull it in, and you're controlling the power. That's the idea of meekness. Jesus reined it in. Oh, I'm not gonna strike back. You know, when they arrested him in Gethsemane and led him away and changed, you think those chains could hold him? They would be like tissue. He could have just gone, poof. Oh no, what are you gonna do to me now? Oh, you're going to come at me with those swords. What am I going to do? Peter, help me. <laughs> to show you his power, when they came into Gethsemane to arrest him, he said, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. That's the same God that said, let there be light, and there was light. I am. And it says they all fell backwards. I mean, can you see that scene? There were their swords and their spears and their shields and, and the cook, 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 like dominoes collapsing on the ground. He could have said, I am, and you were. Bye. <laughs> Problem over. No, it was meekness. He did not defend himself. He went to the cross for our sins. But here he displays anger. Why? Because these people were keeping others from God. You say, I don't understand. Okay, here's how it worked. In the temple, they had an outer area called the court of the Gentiles. I don't know if you realize this, but it was God's desire that not only his people, 
in covenant with him. The Jews would have a relationship with him. But he extended his grace to the Gentiles as well. Because in Isaiah 56, 6 to 8 it says, God speaking, I'll bless the Gentiles who commit themselves to the Lord and serve Him and love His name and worship Him and don't desecrate the Sabbath. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And that's what Jesus is citing. He's saying, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of iniquity. So here's the idea. These people were ripping others off and keeping them from God. Instead of praying for the people, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, they were praying on the people, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. Praying on them. Here's the way it worked. They had a little racket going where no matter what kind of an animal you brought in for your sacrifice, they would find something wrong with it even if it was fine. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a little blemish on this. We, we can't accept this. You can't bring this into the temple. But we're having a special closeout deal on pre-approved sacrifices that we will give to you at a marked up price. Jesus saw this and it made him angry. What makes God angry? God is angry when people stand in the way of sinners coming to know Him. And this happens in the church too. For sure. Sometimes people come for the first time and you know they don't know the protocol of church. They don't know the dress code of church. So maybe they come dressed in a way that you know would not seem to be totally appropriate. So you sort of look down and look at the way that girl's dressed. Yeah. You think that's right for a Christian girl? To, how do you know she's a Christian girl? Well, she's in church. Guess what? Non-believers come to church. Yeah, but look at the... Hold on now. Your little look, your attitude could actually hinder her from coming to know the Lord. Let's not get the cart before the horse, okay? Or maybe someone comes in with a t-shirt. They have a slogan. Well, I can't. That's, um, oh, do you see how tatted up? The, what is with all the piercing? Hey, 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 what's with you? What's with you coming down on people that need to know God. You see, God doesn't like it when we get in the way of others coming to know Him. The church is not supposed to be a museum for saints. It's supposed to be a hospital for sinners. A place for people to come and know God. Now I believe when a person really meets Jesus and He transforms their life, it will impact them in every area of their life. The way they think, the way they act, sure, even the way they dress. That all will come in time. But for now, let's just try to get people to God. Let's not stop them from coming to God. Let me throw in one other thing. Now I said things that tick me off. This actually makes me mad, and I'm serious. And this really fits the point I'm making. It's when people are coming forward to respond to the invitation to accept Christ and they have to go around Christians who are leaving early. You know what I'm talking about? Because you feel like, well, this would be a good time to go and get in my car now because I hate to fight the crowds. And, and so I, I stand here at this pulpit and I look at that back door as I'm giving an invitation and you stand up and slowly make your way out as people are coming down the aisle and they actually have to go around you to come forward and make a commitment to Christ. Now, if you have an emergency and you have to get out, by all means, please do. But other than that, would you please stay seated and not get in the way of people coming to Christ. And if you're sitting next to a person and grabbing their coat, and they're, and they just say, don't do that. Just, just stay, you know, be respectful. Because what does that say to a non-believer? Here they are, they, they've managed to get, muster up the courage to walk down an aisle in front of a bunch of strangers and stand in front of some weird bald preacher and pray a prayer, God bless them, and they've come all this distance, and they're having to go around you. What does that say about you? Well, what it looks like it's saying, maybe you don't intend this, but it looks like you're saying, I really could care less. I want to just get out of here early. You know what? If you want to get out of here early, why don't you sit in the back row or sit outside, and then you can leave, and it won't create as much of a distraction. And think about that. Because here's the question to ask yourself. Are you a bridge or a barrier to people coming to Jesus? Are you getting in the way or are you helping them along the way? Here's another question. 
What kind of a witness are you? Now listen, you are a witness. The question is, are you a good one or a bad one? Because people are watching you. They're watching me. Let's make sure that we are bridges, not barriers, to people coming to Jesus. Because when we get in the way, that makes God angry. Well, what does Jesus do? He goes in and he cleanses the temple. And here's an interesting little twist on the story. This is the second time he did it. The first time it's recorded in the Gospel of John. And that time he used a whip. Hello? A whip he made himself and drove him out. But now he's back again. Why? Well, I'm sure after he cleansed it the first time, it was a clean house. But then a little time passes and one guy sets his table up again. Another guy sets his up. Pretty soon there's 10 more, 20 more, maybe even more than there were before. So he has to re-cleanse the temple again. In the same way, when we first come to Christ, changes happen. Filthy habits are banished. A new purpose and focus grips our life. But as time passes, sometimes some of those old things find their way back into our lives. Those little sins, so-called, take root and begin to grow again. And our lives are cluttered with things that don't belong. So Jesus comes back and is ready to clean house. It's spring now. And one of the things that people often do this time of the year is spring cleaning, right? I wonder if some of us could use a little spring cleaning in our lives. Because there's some messes. There's some things that don't belong. Some things that are cluttering our hearts spiritually. I don't know about you, but by nature I am a messy person. Uh, but the weird thing is I don't like to be in messy environments, which is very frustrating. <laughs> because I create the places I'm in and make them messy. But you know, I'm busy. If I'm cooking something, I don't want to clean. I want to eat it. Clean it later. Uh, you know, if I'm working on a message, I have books piled up and papers and it's a big mess. I'll get to it later. Now my wife is the polar opposite of me. She's always cleaning. In fact, after she cooks, she's cleaning before she'll even eat the food. I'll say, Kathy, the food's getting cold. She says, you go ahead and eat. I want to just clean. She, I think she actually likes to clean. You know, she'll make the bed when I'm in it still sometimes. <laughs> That's why I haven't been here sometimes on Sundays. I was <laughs> trapped <laughs> in very clean sheets. She's always cleaning. She never stops cleaning. She straightens out constantly. She says, have three piles. Keep, give away, throw away. So put it in one of those piles. Which one? I don't know. I, I, I want to hold on. You throw it away. No, don't throw it away. And No, keep it. Well, okay, I'll keep it. You're keeping too much. Give it away. No, I don't want to give it away. You know, it's a struggle. Or like little pack rats. So all this stuff starts building up in our lives. Now, I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about things that don't belong. And instead of dealing with it on a daily basis, you let it build up until you're effectively having a spiritual crisis in your life. That's because you've gone about it in the Greg way of cleaning, which is the wrong way. It's the procrastinator's way. It's the mentality, never do today what you can put off until tomorrow. So we'll let things build up in our lives. And then if you're smart, you'll do it the Catholic way, which is constantly confessing your sin before God. Because guess what? You sin every single day. Not me. Well, you just sinned when you said that, so here you go. <laughs> You've already got your sin. What do you mean? Oh, you can't? No, no, you do. Trust me. The Bible even says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because sin is not just the breaking of a commandment, doing what is wrong. It is not doing what I'm supposed to do, right? Sin of omission. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So we all sin. It's sort of like when I wear white pants, like I'm wearing today. White pants. Now, here's what I notice. Whenever I wear white pants, I always have like little marks and stains on them. I, I, you know, and because I walk by and I rub against the tire of the car and a black thing there, and oh, I dropped the oh, I can't. Why is it I always spill when I'm wearing white pants? I'll say, you know what? I spill all the time. I just don't see it the rest of the time. Because 99% of the time I wear dark jeans and they just sort of absorb everything. But you know what? I think I spill as much in my jeans as I do in my white pants, but white pants display dirt. 
So in the same way, when we're going through life, we say, well, I don't really think I'm sinning that much, but actually you are. So here's what you need to do. You need to confess it to God. 1 John 1, 8 to 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you've come here today with a lot of problems. I don't know what to do, you think to yourself. I don't know how to sort this out. I have this addiction. I have this problem. I have this vice. And I've tried to change, but I can't. What do I do? You say, Jesus, clean house. Lord, help me. You don't say, I'll clean my life up and come to God. No, you come to God and let Him clean your life up. And as we close today in prayer, I would like to invite you to come to Jesus because maybe you've joined us here today and you don't know God in a personal way. You don't have this hope of heaven when you die. You have a big old hole in your heart you've tried to fill with all the things this world offers to no avail. Meanwhile, here's Jesus who died on the cross for you and paid the price for every sin you've ever committed. And he rose again from the dead. And Jesus Christ stands at the door of your life and he knocks and says, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. Would you like to ask Jesus to come into your life today? And maybe there are some of you that have known the Lord but have fallen away. You've allowed a bunch of junk back into your life that does not belong. You need to make a recommitment to Christ. Whatever your need is, respond to this invitation right now if you want to get right with God. Let's all bow our heads for a prayer. Father, I pray now for every person listening to this message, wherever they are. Speak to their heart. Bring about the conviction in their heart from your spirit. Let them see their need for Jesus and help them to come to you now, we pray. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, how many of you would say today, Greg, pray for me. I want my sin forgiven. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. Pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Christ to come into your life and you want him to forgive you of your sin, you want your guilt taken away. You want to go to heaven when you die. Would you lift your hand up right now wherever you're sitting? And I want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you there in the aisle. God bless you up in the balcony. You want Christ to come into your life. Lift your hand up right now. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? God bless you. How about up in the balcony there? You want God's forgiveness. Lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. God bless you up there. God bless you. Maybe you're outside in the amphitheater. Of course, I can't see you here, but the Lord sees you. You want His forgiveness today. Lift your hand up out there in the amphitheater as well. And you up in the court building watching on the big screen. If you need to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, lift your hand too. Right now. Saying, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Anybody else? Lift your hand now. God bless you. All right, now I'm gonna ask that all of you that just lifted your hand, if you would just stand to your feet right now and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer of commitment. I want you to stand to your feet wherever you are. If you lifted your hand, even if you did not, but you want Christ to come into your life, you want his forgiveness, just stand up. That's right, just stand up. Stand up, don't be embarrassed. Others are standing, you're not the only one. Stand up, outside in the amphitheater, stand to your feet out there. If you wanna make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, just stand up. Up in the court building, you stand too. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Anybody else? You wanna make this commitment or recommitment to Christ? Stand to your feet up in the balcony. God bless you. In this final moment, stand now and I'll lead you in a prayer. Anybody else? Just stand now. All right, all of you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is where you're asking Jesus Christ to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Pray this now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross and shed your blood 
for every sin I have ever committed. I turn from that sin today. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my God. And be my friend. I choose to follow you, Lord, from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's congratulate these folks that just prayed. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you guys.